Gentlewoman reserves. For what purpose is the gentlewoman from New York? Seeking? New York, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate my colleague uh, yielding me the time, uh, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. Woman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, today the majority intends to pass a resolution of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act to overturn the Department of Labor's recent rulemaking requiring financial advisors providing retirement investment advice to abide by a fiduciary standard, meaning that they must act in the best interest of their clients, which seems perfectly legitimate to me. That's right, the House majority is disapproving of financial advisors acting in the best interest of their clients. Despite the growing importance of individual workers and retirees obtaining sound investment advice, many financial advisors are still not legally required to meet the fiduciary standard of acting in their clients' best interests, but instead required only to meet a lower suitability quote-unquote standard. This creates a conflict of interest where advisors are permitted to promote investments that maximize their own returns rather than the client's returns as long as the investments were still, quote, suitable, unquote, for their clients. That means a small few, and a very small few, of unscrupulous financial advisors have been legally permitted to steer clients toward financial products that maximize the advisor's profits through higher fees and commissions, even if investments that would produce a greater return for the client are available. Few financial advisors, I am sure, are taking advantage of their clients saving for retirement. Some experts, however, feel that this rule is necessary. In fact, the White House Council of Economic Advisors estimates that the cost to American retirees is $15 billion annually. That is no small sum and I think does cry out for attention. It is absurd that due to loopholes in the current system, retirees do not have a legal right to expect that their financial advisors are acting in their best interests. When you visit your doctor, you have the legal right to expect that he, she will prescribe whatever treatment is in your best interest. You shouldn't have to guess whether or not your financial advisor is following the same fiduciary standard. The Labor Department's final rule will close these loopholes, <clears throat> protect workers' savings, and ensures that financial advisors act in their clients' best interests. The final result, the rule is the result of a thoughtful, thorough, and transparent multi-year process that stands in stark contrast to the majority's decision to rush to judgment and overturn this rule at a record unheard of pace. The majority marked up the resolution, H.S. Res. 88, only 13 days after the final rule had been published. So in 13 days, they understood that it was totally unnecessary, despite the $17 billion lost to clients. This is shorter than the 55 days that other committees wait on average to ensure that there is ample time to fully understand the impact of the final rule. In its rush to judgment, the majority has been blinded by its ideological opposition to any action taken by the Obama administration and has missed the many changes that have left industry leaders optimistic, including many of the major financial houses and many of the people whose livelihood is in this kind of advising. The majority is ignoring two important protections a rule will provide to the American workers trying to save for their retirements. First, a peace of mind, and second, to make sure that everything is done in their interest. Mr. Speaker, all of us are sent here to work in the best interest of the American people, not to shield financial companies. And I urge my colleagues to vote no on this disapproval resolution. What's more, in yet another grab bag rule that joins two unrelated measures under a single rule, Republicans are proposing another misguided bill to meddle in the District of Columbia's local affairs. The majority has already tried to overturn the district's marijuana, gun, and abortion laws, and now they intend to write D.C.'s ed education law in an attack on the Democrat the District of Columbia's right to home rule. The D.C. voucher program exempts students from the protection of federal civil law rights that apply to public schools. Now, why in the world would we want to do that to them? 
and the federally funded programs that go with those civil service law protections. And under the voucher program, federal funding is considered assistance to the voucher student and not to the school, and therefore the voucher program is not considered a federally funded program. Program is exempt from Titles IV and VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972, the Equal Educational Opportunities Act of 1974, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and Titles II and III of the Americans with a Disability Act of 1990. Why in the world? I appreciate that we're not doing anything here that really is going to affect the government anyway, and undoubtedly this again will be a one-house bill, and we have yet wasted a week's worth of about $24 million that it takes to run the House. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this bill. I reserve the balance of my time.